All right, awesome. Thanks, James. So, hey, everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm Ian Stewart. I'm a postdoctoral fellow with the Midas Institute, and I'm excited to be moderating this uh, talk series. Um, we're going to have two really great um, assistant professors uh, talk to you all today. Uh, first, we have Ben Green, um, who's a postdoctoral scholar in the Michigan Society of Fellows, as well as an assistant professor in the School of Public Policy and the School of Information. Uh, we also have um, Jeff Shang, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Society of Fellows as well, um, and is also an assistant professor in School of Information. Um, they have really great talks for you lined up about um, data science broadly applied to public policy and to art. Um, so I am looking forward to hearing what they have to say. And uh, without any further ado, uh, let's get started with um, Dr. Ben Green. All right, All right. Really there we go. Cool. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm really excited to be able to take part in this double session today uh, with Jeff. Um, so I want to talk for my brief remarks about some of the challenges that arise when we try to apply data science to address and solve public policy problems. So in many areas of public policy, there's a great deal of excitement and interest about solving problems using data science and algorithms. Uh, applications such as smart cities in the criminal justice system, in child welfare, public health, and more. Government agencies are exploring data science applications. They're building data science teams. Many academic and, and data scientists in industry are partnering with governments. And there are growing research areas such as public interest tech, data science for social good, and more. Yet despite the optimism that surrounds data science applications, the actual deployment of these tools by governments has involved many controversies and injustices. Some of the most notable include examples such as racial discrimination, kicking people off of welfare benefits, and leading to wrongful arrests. And so these issues raise significant questions about how governments can take advantage of the opportunities presented by data science without incurring the injustices that are all too often associated with, with real world implementations of data science tools. Uh, and so what I want to focus on in this talk is that one of the central causes of these uh, algorithmic harms is a set of limitations within data science methodology. Typical data science methods lack the capacity to fully reason about the social and political impacts of algorithmic interventions. If we want to attain the potential benefits and avoid the harms of data science and public policy, we need to develop new methods that enable more rigorous reasoning about the social impacts of algorithmic interventions. In other words, public policy applications require new methods for the design, evaluation, and governance of data science tools. So what do I mean by methodology? By methodology, I'm referring to a set of systematic tools for problem solving. Across all areas, methodologies provide a language for comprehending and reasoning about the world. These languages shape how the practitioners of those methodologies see the world, understand problems, and develop solutions to those problems. So we can think about what the impacts of these methodologies are. Um, this quote from philosopher John Dewey, he describes, to mistake the problem involved is to cause subsequent inquiry to be irrelevant or go astray. The way in which the problem is conceived decides what specific suggestions are entertained and which are dismissed. And so the way that we're formulating problems and understanding the way to analyze situations directly shapes the path that we go down as we try to solve those problems. And this has particular stakes when we're dealing with issues of politics and public policy. As philosopher Elizabeth Anderson describes, sound political theories must be capable of representing normatively relevant political facts. If they can't represent certain injustices, then they can't help us identify them. If they can't represent the causes of certain injustices, then they can't help us identify solutions. And so when we think with these ideas in mind, when we think about the role of data science in public policy, we can't simply ask just how these tools work. We must also step back and consider whether the language and frameworks of data science 
are equipped to identify the full context of public policy settings and help us identify policy reforms in light of those contexts. So when we think about the role of the typical approach to applying data science in public policy, the emphasis is usually on the proficiency of the algorithm. And this seems like a very natural focus. What does it mean to do data science for public policy? It seems natural to say that it means applying the existing tools of data science to real world public policy problems. And so in practice, what we see are that most discussions of algorithms for public policy uh, focus on the technical quality of these tools, uh, typically with direct comparisons between the accuracy and fairness of the predictions made by machine learning algorithms with the accuracy and fairness of predictions made by humans. Uh, we can see a notable example of this phenomenon, and I'll use this as a running example throughout this talk, around pretrial risk assessments. Uh, algorithms that predict the likelihood that defendants will be arrested or will fail to appear in court before their trials uh, in order to inform the judgments of judges about whether to release or detain defendants before trial. And so typically the focus is on the accuracy of these tools and I think this quote from Arnold Ventures which is a organization that's developed one widely used risk as pretrial risk assessment in the US uh, really demonstrates some of this thinking. They write, the development of risk assessments over the past 60 years reflects research showing that human decision making can be deeply flawed, reflecting ingrained biases that are virtually impossible to correct. Providing judges with an objective means to consider only relevant data may counterbalance some of those biases and lead to fairer pretrial outcomes. So we have here this direct comparison between the accuracy and fairness of algorithmic predictions with the accuracy and fairness of human predictions with the superiority of the first category uh, justifying the development and implementation of these tools. So I want to give three examples of how this type of approach falls short in understanding the, in evaluating and understanding the potential benefits and harms of tools like risk assessments in public policy. The first example involves the difference between decisions and predictions. The typical focus of these data science tools is to make high quality predictions as accurately as possible and they're adopted based on the comparisons with human predictions. And indeed, when, all, when our focus is on accuracy, data science algorithms are almost always going to seem superior to humans. However, in public policy, most government decisions aren't actually just about making predictions. What they involve instead are decisions that uh, are shaped by multiple different factors. And we, have, we can look at some of the research in political science and law and other areas about what it means to make decisions in public policy settings. As one book writes, the proper implementation of public policy depends on street level bureaucrats capacity to interpret vague directives, strike compromises between competing values and prioritize the allocation of scarce resources. Another book describes street level bureaucrats have discretion because the nature of service provision calls for human judgment that cannot be programmed and for which machines cannot substitute. And so evaluations of algorithmic predictions are ultimately underspecified for informing whether algorithms can improve public policy. And we can see a particular example of this type of balancing act with pretrial decisions. On the one hand, there's a goal of reducing the risk of flight or rearrest. Yet on the other hand, a central value in these decisions is to prioritize the liberty of defendants in order to reduce the various harms that are associated with pretrial detention. Now these two values are in pretty direct conflict with one another. And so ultimately public policy in this setting and many others really depends on the balance that is struck between these competing factors in ways that cannot ultimately be pre-programmed but require attention to the particular circumstances of each individual and individual case. And so in fact, optimizing many decisions for prediction accuracy often conflicts with other values that are essential to public policy. The second example involves human uses of algorithms. So the typical focus in, in data science evaluations is on 
the algorithm as an autonomous system, treating the, the algorithm as a decision maker unto itself. Yet in practice, what actually happens is that data science systems are, present a prediction or some form of advice to a human who then has to decide how to respond or incorporate that in information into their own decision. And so no matter how well we characterize the behaviors of the algorithms on their own, we won't be able to fully understand their impacts unless we also study how people interpret and use these systems. And in fact, there's a growing body of research showing that humans use algorithms in a variety of unexpected and undesirable ways. With respect to predictions, uh, people are bad at evaluating the accuracy of human predictions. People's judgments about when to follow or diverge from algorithmic recommendations are typically incorrect. And people respond to algorithmic predictions in biased ways. There are similar uh, outcomes with respect to decision making. Algorithms can prompt people to weigh risk more heavily as a factor in decision making, increasing racial disparities. Evidence in practice shows that judges override algorithms, uh, often in highly punitive ways. And so these behaviors in decision making counteract the potential benefits of improving human prediction accuracy in practice. So in both experimental settings and in practice, algorithms end up not creating the desired outcomes because the people making decisions use these algorithms in unexpected ways. There's often a significant gap between the expectations that motivate the adoption of data science tools and the actual impacts of these tools in practice. And then the third example uh, considers uh, efforts to analyze algorithmic fairness and to use algorithms as tools for reforming public policy to create greater equality. And although algorithmic fairness can tell us a great deal, uh, and so this methodology, the, it can tell us a great deal about what happens within, data, dis, with, within decision making procedures, it also has a very narrow focus. Algorithmic fairness limits analysis to the mechanisms and outcomes of specific decision making procedures in isolation from the context of those decisions. And so it ends up getting overlooked in most of the research around algorithmic fairness are factors such as the social in, uh, and structural inequalities that are reflected in group differences in uh, base rates of particular outcomes that shape many debates around algorithmic fairness, as well as the actions and the policies that are taken in response to a risk assessment's advice. And so because algorithmic fairness methods cannot account for these factors, it often suggests approaches to reform that uh, uphold structural inequalities, even while appearing to be fair within the technical sense of how we define algorithmic fairness. And so there's often a significant disconnect between judgments of algorithmic fairness and the actual social impacts of algorithms in practice. So to address these various sets of issues, it's not enough simply to incorporate new technical enhancements into data science. Instead, we need to find new ways of thinking about how to develop, evaluate, and govern data science in light of broader social and political factors. Central to this goal is shifting from an emphasis on algorithms as isolated technical tools that can be evaluated based on how they perform in a relatively theoretical context to really focusing on the effects that they have when integrated into real world settings and those real world impacts being the ultimate definer of what these tools do and are. So with respect to the first example, uh, we need to find new ways of, of questioning whether decisions can actually be enhanced algorithmically, even when algorithms can make accurate predictions and may even be able to improve human prediction accuracy. At the same time, these systems may actually are often not beneficial for decisions that involve balancing multi predictions with other factors that compete often with predictions. With respect to the second example, we need to find ways to think not just about the algorithm on its own, but to really evaluate the entire decision making process. With, when we're thinking about uh, integrating systems into public policy, we can't just look at how the algorithm performs, and instead we can additionally conduct trials uh, human, human interaction trials to study how algorithms actually influence human decision making in practice, helping us to get a better understanding of what the practical effects of implementing these tools might be. 
And then finally, with respect to algorithmic fairness, we need to think not just about decision-making procedures in isolation, but to consider the broader social hierarchies and institutional structures. And this will often present different but more effective strategies for how algorithms can be tools for reform to create more equal societies. Rather than thinking just about how we might optimize specific decision-making procedures, we can also look more broadly about how to alleviate uh, social hierarchies and reduce the scope and the stakes of decisions that act on those hierarchies. So to step back into all of this, uh, there are of course many challenges as well as opportunities ahead. First and foremost are many of the broader structural forces that shape the the applications of algorithms in public policy. It's not simply about the methodologies that data scientists and technologists use, but also about broader structural forces around the logics that government agencies are following, as well as the structures of technology development and governance. Those are significant challenges that exist beyond the scope just of data science methodology on its own. Other dimensions present both opportunities and challenges. Uh, with respect to internal government capacity, there's a significant opportunity here uh, to increase the ability and the expertise for data science within government agencies, which could help to reduce the influence of technology companies, as well as to tailor the development of these tools to more of the real world context in which they're being used. But there are also many challenges here as uh, government data science teams typically face many barriers around relatively basic issues such as data access, data quality, and so on. And then finally, we see many new models of data science pedagogy and practice that are uh, gaining momentum and excitement from public interest tech to data science for social good to civic technology. These present an exciting opportunity where more and more practitioners are becoming excited about the potential for data science to have positive impacts and increasingly aware of many of the risks of data science tools in practice. An essential challenge here is that it's not enough simply to adopt the label of these, uh, of these movements, but instead to really think about how do we provide new methods, pathways, and cultures for rigorously improving public policy using data science. Here, fortunately, there's lots of interdisciplinary knowledge that we can draw on from HCI to STS, philosophy, law, and more to inform what public interest tech and so on these other labels mean, not just as a label, but really as an alternative methodology for what it means to do data science. And so I believe that if we face these challenges and develop these new methods, we can find important new ways to improve public policy using data science. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn things over to Jeff. All right, good luck. <laughs> Got it? Cool. And the mic's, mic's on. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, I'm really excited to be sharing today. Um, and Ben and I got paired up to do this talk almost accidentally in some ways, but it turns out that I think there's going to be a lot of great crossover between the two talks because I'm going to approach this issue of data science and algorithms from a completely different point of view, not public policy, but actually in the form of creativity and art, something that a lot of people don't actually talk about that much. Um, and I'll get into more of that later as to maybe my thoughts as to why. Um, before I start, um, I want to share a little bit about my own background and why this talk interests me personally. Um, I've got a huge variety in my own disciplinary training. I just finished my doctorate in sociology and a PhD minor in computer science and a uh, master's in computer science as well with a focus in AI and HCI. But before this, um, I did a master's in fine arts and studio art. I was, I'm actually trained as a studio artist um, and worked for 10 years um, after getting my BA in photography and filmmaking um, and, and worked as a professional artist for 10 years. And I taught photography for four of those years at UC Santa Barbara and as a visiting lecturer for a semester at Harvard before starting my PhD in sociology and graduate work in computer science. And so, a lot of this work I did in sort of the creative world helps inform the current research that I'm doing now in 
AI and sociology. And so the talk itself is really understanding photographic style with deep learning. And, and what do I mean by this? Well, I'm gonna step backwards a little bit and think about art production and AI, which are often at a philosophical tension between each other, right? We think of these two things as opposites in some way. And why do I say that? Well, we know that AI is great at, at learning. It can mimic styles. You can actually train deep learning models to basically copy the past styles of various artists. And a famous paper that does this is by Gaddis, Ecker, and Benth in 2015. They published um, this paper on a neural algorithm of artistic style. And here, you can see some of the results of this work, right? So you take the upper left-hand uh, photograph and you apply sort of a Van Gogh style to it or a Matisse or Cezanne. And you can actually take the photograph from the upper left um, and apply different styles to make it look like Van Gogh's Starry Night. This is an algorithm and um, code you can download. I think they made it open source. It's something that's super popular. There's all these blogs about how to do it. And it really highlights how deep learning can be used to mimic past artistic style. But production of new forms of creativity, and this comes from the sociological literature, requires the breaking of old patterns and reinventing it. So a huge uh, strand of literature talks about genres in both music and artistic practice and trends. And you can think about our lives today. And you know, if you think about music genres, right, you can think about how rock and roll was sort of melded into eventually, you know, strands in hip hop or country today with like Lil Nas X is now sort of a blend between different genres, right? And, and really artistic style is not just about copying and learning what has come before you, but becoming, but being very creative and breaking an old mold and having the public gravitate towards that as something new. Painting, for example, here is really hundreds of years of this, right? If you watch the genres of painting go across time. So how do art students, I'm gonna kind of pivot a little bit here and I'm gonna go back to my days in teaching art photography, which was what I did for many years before I moved to a different field. Um, how do art students learn to be good photographers? The classic way that the teaching of photography occurs is that courses are taught through looking and critiquing. And what that means is students will look at thousands of good art photographs and they'll try to learn how to be a great artist themselves by seeing what great work has come before them. And it's similar in the process of training a neural net. So when I was learning my computer science stuff, I was like, wow, this is fascinating because it's like how I taught my photography students. You just sort of like throw up like thousands of great pictures at them and you hope that they learn in this weird like deep learning black box model of like how to become a better photographer. And so how is style then applied in artistic photography? Well, like painting and other media, you can think of music, artistic photographers are known for often what is called style. And there are two parts to photography in the action of style, right? You take a photograph, so all of you have taken a photograph before, you pull out your iPhone or whatever, you start looking around and you wanna take a photograph. The second part of this, which is really, I think, the core of what a lot of being an art photographer is, is selecting the best image from that whole mass of pictures you've taken to, to choose which picture you use to represent your style. And a photographer will go out in the world, they'll take a bunch of images, and they will then go into their studio or wherever they are and select which ones are the best ones. Style is incorporated on both sides, right? Because you have your own style and your practice of art, but when you're editing and wanting to select something to show others, um, you actually incorporate your style there. And so this selection process, the second half of this process I've outlined, is what I'm most interested in understanding intersections with deep learning. So I'm gonna just show some examples of various artists to give you an example of how like wide ranging style can be. And this is the work of Walker Evans. Um, you can sort of see the sort of like very squared frontal nature of the way Walker Evans photographs. This is Deanne Arbus using a very high contrast flash and this is the way she photographed. Um, this is the Dutch artist Reneke Dijkstra who's, um, uh, you know, photographs sell for millions of dollars at auction. Um, but her work is very, um, very, I guess, the angles of it and, and very much sort of the style of, of confrontation and the way she takes her photographs. Philip Lorca de Corsia, a famous Yale professor of photography, um, 
the staged lighting movie set nature of his work. And Ansel Adams, many of you might have heard of Ansel Adams in the sort of beautiful landscapes. And so this is just an example of how sort of, uh, how much variety there is in the actual style of different photographers. And this is actually a contact sheet for my own work from my first phot photography class. Um, it's a contact sheet basically showing that like, you would go through dozens and dozens of these rolls of pictures and select maybe 10 from like a thousand photographs that you would basically say are your best ones. And so the real question is like, which are those best photographs? And so there are two questions that I have when I'm approaching this is one is can deep learning and AI detect style between and amongst different art photographers? And the second question I've had is can AI techniques be used to help us see like another artist? Spoiler alert, question one was attempted and this is gonna be the focus of the results of this talk. Question two is for the future. I am still in the process of getting the time and space and energy to try to figure out two, but I'm gonna end with some thoughts on question two um, today. My data and methods for this project were I self-obtained an archive of images and corresponding artists. They consist of 20,000 images from 511 art photographers from the 20th and 21st centuries. I actually sourced these from a friend of mine, a professor of photography, Greg Halpern. He teaches at the Rochester Institute of Photography. Um, we went to school together and learned photography together. And he was just really, really generous in saying, this is the archive I use to teach my students photography. Why don't you throw a bunch of neural nets at it and see what happens? Um, and I used a convolutional neural net, a ResNet 18 model with transfer learning. And I really need to thank Justin Johnson, who is an assistant professor in computer science here. We actually happen to be graduate students at Stanford at the same time. And he was Fei-Fei Li's head TA while I was taking a course on deep learning. And um, my TA was like, you should look at Justin Johnson's like open source code. And I used that as sort of the um, backbone of a lot of the coding infrastructure um, I did to set up um, this work. Um, I used pre-trained weights from ImageNet. And um, I'm not gonna go too deep into the weeds on the actual nuts and bolts of it, but this will help just give an idea of some of the pre-processing that occurred. Um, each artist's photographs were split into a 70%, 30% train test sample so that the test images were never duplicated in the train set. Um, I resized each image, I zero centered and normalized them. And then in the training part, I did a random crop flipping 50% of the images just to really give as, as much randomization in the training data as possible. Then in the testing, I resized the images similar to the training set, but I took a two, uh, the same size crop, but just from the center for each test. And I'm gonna go to the results. Um, and the results help motivate a little bit of the explanation of the messiness of the data sample itself. I mentioned before, I just sort of like borrowed this big data set and cleaned it as much as I could from a friend who teaches photography. And because um, of just the nature of art photography itself, some photographers have only published like 40 images ever in their life as like their best images. Some have archives of hundreds of images. And so I sort of had to play around with um, the difficulty in the idea that there was just a different number from various artists. So I split the trials into five different ones, kind of making cutoff points between how many photographs could I get from each artist, right? So, there were six artists where I had over 250 photographs from each one, I had 31 artists where I had over 100, and so on there. And then you can see in the best train and best test um, trials, what was the best accuracy rates, right? So when you have six artists, um, and actually the confusion matrix on the lower left shows the six artists, um, these are all actually black and white photographers on the lower left, and essentially, um, there was just really great accuracy. Like the neural nets were like, this is easy. Like keep giving me stuff. The style here is super easy to figure out. Um, then when I increased it to 31 artists in the sample, um, there was still actually really great uh, accuracy with this. Like the confusion matrix here, basically the diagonal shows a match. Um, the depth of blue shows how high, how the, the uh, higher degree of a match. Um, and you can kind of see on the diagonal, there's a pretty good match, right? So here we, we see that neural nets are actually pretty good at this. And it's not, actually not a surprise. Um, previous computer scientists have actually done this on paintings and found that it's very good with paintings. Um, recognizing style in painting is actually um, over 80% accuracy in many of the um, previous research that's been done. So there were three main findings from this work. Um, 
One is there was much higher accuracy for artists with more pronounced quote unquote style. So I'm gonna go back to René Dijkstra, whose work I showed previously, who has a very formal and distinct style. And here in the 31 artist trial, she had a 93% accuracy rate, um, which was higher than many of the other um, artists in that trial. But in the 110 artist trial, there was an 88% accuracy rate. So it held really high. And her work is very likely to be discerned by experts, meaning that if you just took a photograph of hers and put it in front of a museum curator, very undoubtedly that person should be able to just say, oh yeah, that's so-and-so's work pretty, pretty easily. And this is kind of what um, her work is again, just to remind you. The second finding from this work was that errors were made on artists in similar genres. And what I mean by this is that, um, so if you look at the confusion matrix here, I was interested in like looking not at the diagonal, but where was there like a, a semi-dark blue box? Like whose artist, um, who was confused with who basically? And so a darker shade somewhere like 0.22 or 0.36 will show up. And I just sort of match like, well, what is the algorithm doing in misclassifying something? Because that misclassification could help me learn what it's actually trying to recognize. And here we see that errors were made on artists in similar genres. And um, Sam Taylor Wood and Philip Lorga de Corsia were confused, for example, at a 0.24 normalized error rate. And both come from the 1990s movement of so-called documentary fiction. And this is, you know, examples of their work. And you can kind of see that even though they're different photographers working in different countries, they come from sort of the same style of photography itself, documentary fiction. And here they were just misclassified almost a quarter of the time. The third finding is that artists who mimic other styles in their work often confuse the model. So the best example of this I found was Cindy Sherman's work. She's an incredibly famous artist. Um, and essentially all her work are self-portraits of herself mimicking different genres of art and film, right? So this is actually a case in which the artist is purposely playing on this idea of it's the same person in different setting. And essentially a human expert will have no problem identifying her work since they recognize Cindy Sherman usually, but a model doesn't always get the segment with her face that can be disguised and there's only 50% accuracy across the board for her work. And so these are four images from her work. It's the same person mimicking styles of different genres. And in this case, the computer algorithm is like, I have no clue what's going on here. It's really like someone else's picture. So future work of this, um, you know, I'm really interested in thinking about how we can train a model to see and edit like somebody else. Um, I'm gonna go back to the contact sheet. So the grease pencil, you can kind of see like this faint line. That's actually not my handwriting. That was the, um, handwriting of my uh, former professor of photography as an undergraduate and a mentor of mine in the field. Um, and he actually just passed away last year um, after sort of mentoring my photography career. And um, part of my own kind of like thought process is could I ever train something to see like him or see like another artist, for example. And so, you know, one of these things is, you know, figuring out the editing and selection and picking of the best image and can algorithms be trained using contact sheets? For example, if you had positives and negatives of great artists, could it learn, you know, what is a good photograph from just kind of learning on the negatives of an artist? Um, could we theoretically use an archive of famous photographers and even advanced art students um, to train various models, to recognize what a good image, and to really like train like how they see. Like, could I have a Walker Evans like algorithm to run across a bunch of photographs to see which photographs would be picked by the algorithm? And I would apply um, this in you know, we could apply this in photography courses and our own work and understanding of culture. There are of course some challenges to this, and um, this sort of dovetails a little bit in some ways with Ben's work because it's almost like the, the opposite problem, but we come to sort of the same space here. Um, one is that is creating this new style, um, is this creating a new style or learning from the past? And I actually argue this is a hybrid approach to understanding style because we're using both human decision-making and an algorithm at the same time. Humans themselves, we learn what good art is by absorbing in our own brains what artistic style is. There's no rules, like, I mean, 
you could read like, oh, there's the one thirds rule of photography, but the first thing you learn in a photo class is like that's, that rule is actually like doesn't apply to like half the great photographs in the canon. It's kind of a weird thing. They're, the rules are kind of meant to be broken. Um, and you can only rely on humans so much um, because if you think about looking at thousands of photographs for a human being trying to edit them, it's exhausting. You know, my former mentor and I would sit um, looking at my contact sheets for like over one or two hours sometimes um, trying to figure out which ones were the best ones. And that's exhausting. And so algorithms could be actually really benefic beneficial in this. You may miss an image in your own edit and having something flagged by technology and seeing something unexpected could be a benefit to artistic practice. And here, creativity is augmented by AI and not supplanted by it. Um, and that's actually one of the you know, things that I think is um, where we're kind of converging here in terms of thinking about AI and deep learning and where we can use it is in what cases are we able to supplant human knowledge and practice with artificial intelligence and deep learning rather than rely on it solely. And I actually, you know, I touched upon this before, but I think one of the reasons so much of today's AI applications are in, you know, self-driving cars is a great example. We were spending billions of dollars on this, right? And not thinking about other areas in which AI could be applied to benefit maybe creativity and the humanistic arts in ways we haven't thought about. And part of this is, to be honest, profits, right? Like, you're not gonna make that much money creating like really cool creative applications to really dig deep on like the human experience. But you know, if you create the perfect self-driving car, you will. On the flip side, there's also so much more danger in those applications, right? So much of um, our thoughts on policymaking is on the fact that if AI gets it wrong in these areas, someone dies, someone goes to jail and, you know, unwilling, uh, unwittingly or whatever. And essentially in this case, you know, if, so if basically the, the photograph is like not a good photograph, then you know, it's fine, you just skip it, right? So anyways, this is um, kind of the end of my presentation and I'm really excited to share this work. It's not actually my main research stream. Um, I study social movements and like the internet. So um, this is just like a, like a side project of mine, but I'd be really excited to hear if any of you are more interested in this, um, if any labs are out there and stuff like that, that would love to collaborate on and stuff like that. So thank you. Great, should we stay up here and then we can, great, okay. Yeah. I'll pull this out and then, yeah. great, perfect. Cool, thanks uh, to Jeff and Ben, that was really awesome. Um, yeah, so I was just, uh, is everything okay? Oh, no, sorry, no, okay, thank cool. you. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I don't speak sign language. Um, uh, yeah, so I wanted to follow up uh, with a couple of my own questions and we'll open it up to everybody for Q&A. Um, I guess the first one was, I really wanted to follow up on the last point you brought up, Jeff, which is about like decision making. And um, I wanted to know if you both wanted to talk briefly about the, um, uh, the sort of um, current like uh, cost associated with human decision making that AI could potentially like alleviate um, in sort of both of your respective domains. Um, yeah, as well as just general thoughts about like, decision making and yeah. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I think there's always this tension on bias, right? Like, I think, you know, it's, it, it was really fascinating for me to do this work and really think about, and, and to be fair, it's, um, art is easy ground sometimes, right? Because like, you're not, life and death is not necessarily part of it. Um, and in bias, in some cases, it's, I mean, in many decision-making areas, it's bad. In art, it's almost like you want to put your spin on things and you want to break the rules, right? Like as I talked before, like the sociology of art and culture is about breaking the rules just enough such that you get noticed and your work rises to the top, right? But that's like not how you sentence somebody or not, that's not how you create a driverless car, right? That's like a totally different application. And it, but in some ways I almost find AI to be almost pr more promising in th the field of art because it's, it's, it's great if, the neural, if we don't know what the neural net is doing. It's fine if it's learning and trying to like outgame you in some ways, right? But it's not okay if it tries to break the rules with a car, with a, you know, it doesn't recognize a person mm -hmm. the, the road or something. Actually, yeah, so could you, I'm curious, Jeff, to hear your thoughts on this idea of how we're training students or an AI, because there seems to be this tension between, right, Groundbreaking art is art that breaks all of the rules, but we train students by teaching them to essentially learn all of the rules that have been followed. 
and you know, like just input hundreds of images and see what's been chosen to essentially mimic past styles. So how does, I mean, how does that work as a pedagogical model and how does that maybe affect the role of AI and creativity at maybe different levels, either for sort of amateurs like me on my iPhone compared to people who want to be at the cutting edge of defining what art photography is? So I think it's actually an even bigger debate. I think it's actually this debate between like humanities and like almost like the bridge of social sciences and the hard sciences, right? Because in some ways, humanities is all about like you have to like if you're an English major, you learn all the whole canon, but you're encouraged to think beyond it, mm -hmm. right? Where you know that's not necessarily the same way we think when we're engineering something. You want to be creative for sure, but you want to like keep following. You, want, you keep building on the old rules to create new engineering. And I guess, to me, it's really highlighting how beautiful those two things are. But I worry sometimes with AI and our obsession with deep learning that we forget about the humanistic potential of a lot of this. You know, I think that sometimes when we're like so much of your work, for example, talks about public policy stuff that that needs rules because public policy is all about making <laughs> rules, right? It's like, mm -hmm. it's like we need to control like the effective control of human beings. And yeah, and I think that's, and I think that's where we're running into the most danger, right? Because, and sometimes I wonder whether or not like we're hitting a limit on what AI can do, but we're not exploring AI enough in other areas that could be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think in public policy, I mean, there's really this central tension between, in many settings, between rules and sort of flexibility and discretion, where we want, we, we sort of simultaneously want to have both things. We want to have some forms of standardization and consistency because that meets certain guidelines of fairness. And yet at the same time, we also want to have flexibility and discretion and judgments that are based on seeing each person as an individual who's uh, you know, particular context and circumstances should shape the decision that's made about them. And, and there are harms to taking both of those ideals to their extreme. And so you can't have one without the other. And so I think the central challenge when we think about AI and public policy is, you know, we need to really drill down in any given setting to how do we balance, what's the balance between those desires for standardization versus flexibility? And how might we combine human and algorithmic decision making in ways that help us achieve that balance and achieve the forms of consistency where we want that, but also the forms of discretion where we want those. And one of the challenges is that right now, the current approaches to doing that really fail to think about what that balance should look like. Um, and so I think that's, that's a real area around both understanding the values of public policy as well as thinking about uh, human algorithm collaborations and how we might better structure these systems so that we can get the types of decision making processes that we want. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks. I guess following up on that, I was actually, my own question I was curious about was um, the issue of trust. I know in a lot of fields, sort of AI comes in and people don't necessarily trust the algorithms right away because it's hard to tell what they're doing, what they're thinking. Um, so I wondered if sort of each of you had something to say about like if in your particular domain, if there's an issue of trust and like how you might sort of find that balance of like, you know, do you completely trust the AI? Do you trust it halfway? In what cases? Mm -hmm. What are the thoughts about that? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting point. And I think in both settings, you know, I think that often experts are the most distrustful of these types of <laughs> systems. So I'm really curious to hear how it works in your world. I mean, I think, right, there's this challenge of really understanding to what extent should people actually trust these systems. On the one hand, you can have experts who are sort of un inappropriately distrustful, saying, I know more than an algorithm ever could, and there's no way that this tool can make predictions better than I can. And that's often not going to be actually the case. Algorithms can largely make more accurate predictions than people. But at the same time, there are many reasons to distrust these tools in terms of their narrow modes of thinking, as well as the evidence around their, their biases and the lack of insight and transparency that's often put into them. And so, we have this strange dance often in public policy where we are implementing the tools because we don't fully trust the human decision makers. But at the same time, because we know that these systems can be flawed, we also want the humans to somewhat distrust the algorithm 
and provide a form of quality control determining when they should follow the system and when they shouldn't follow the system. So you have a little bit of this circular logic and the problem is uh, people are not really good at providing oversight of these algorithms and determining when they should be used and when they shouldn't be used. Um, and so the question of trust gets really thorny and circular and I think uh, oftentimes, yeah, oftentimes there's a sense of distrust that is inappropriate, but oftentimes there's a distrust that is quite appropriate. Um, and again, the challenge is how do we integrate that into our settings of decision making and actually regulating these systems? Right now we're often placing far too much trust as, as sort of policymakers are placing far too much trust in humans to adjudicate how they should make decisions when and how they should oversee algorithms in light of the distrust that we have with respect to algorithms. So yeah, it's a really interesting dimension that gets to a lot of tricky questions. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, trust is interesting. I think um, people in the art world and hum humanities just distrust AI in general, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate because I think of AI much more like a tool in a toolkit that people can use for a variety of things. Um, I also think of it like if AI breaks, is it the tool that's breaking or is it the wrong tool itself, right? So you know, that's, that's what goes on in my mind about all of it. Um, I would think, I would love it if, I mean, we just had this talk in the information school about someone trying to use AI to write um, short stories or fiction or stuff like that, right? And I think there's always this level of like, no, you can't, like, like people kind of, you know, get worried about that because you're, you're like replacing human creativity with a machine. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily what we want to do. I think we want to just augment the creative process in human thought and collaboration with machines if possible. Yeah. Well, and there's lots of, you know, interesting critiques often of how systems like Spotify algorithms are affecting music production, how algorithms in Amazon are affecting what book production looks like. And so, you know, I don't know how much you think about those yeah, elements of the broader yeah. political economy of what it looks like for algorithms to shape style. And I'll tell you why I think those are horrible. And it's because they're based on profits mm -hmm. and, and like repeat, like the, so this is like something I thought a lot about, right? And there is a whole literature on like algorithms shifting everyone and funneling everyone to like the same stuff. And part of it is the same stuff will sell more stuff and like that drives this like endless cycle. And I think like one of the things I focused on here was like art photography itself, not commercial photography. Mm -hmm. Cause there are like Apple and like other photo places have like, oh, we can do this editing thing to help you pick the best photograph, but they're training it on commercial photographs, right? On what's most pleasing. So it's gonna regress to the mean where it's gonna all come to like <laughs> pictures of kittens. I don't know, right? like, <laughs> something that everyone clicks on, right? Versus like actually thinking about this as a, 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 more, a, a more powerful endeavor on like human creativity, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I think part of this is like, pulling it out from these industrial machines of like making money and having academics and artists and, and explore, explore more with these tools. Mm -hmm. We've got a question virtually. Yeah, okay. yeah, let's open it up. And anyone in the audience can ask a question as well. I just need someone to like flag me down and I'll run to you. But I'll <laughs> ask this question that came from our virtual audience um, from Irene Morse. This is for Jeff. Uh, and you'll forgive me, my mouth is very dry. I have a lot of words to read. So uh, I feel like there is an underlying assumption here that you are working with digital photography and are able to capture a nearly infinite number of images, but learning photography used to only be a lot more about being able to capture a moment you only had one chance to do it. Uh, this seems harder for an algorithm as there is data sparsity. Do you think algori algorithms could also be taught to see those key moments or will they always be reliant on having huge amounts of data to sift through? Also, on a more philosophical note, uh, what do you think will happen when an algorithm tells us something is good art, but the art world does not agree? Oh, I mean, I don't think it's the job of an algorithm to say what is good or bad. I think a, a good job is helping you find that moment. And a surprising thing is a lot of curious anecdotes in the history of photography are photographers almost missing that shot that is now iconic. And it took like a photo editor to actually find the, I mean, it was like an editor who was like, wait a second, what's this photograph? And there's actually probably tons of photographs that could become iconic and are really good that people have just missed in history. Given how many, if you ever, um, I mean, I've, I've worked for a commercial photographer and I you know, watched a lot of artists like do their stuff. It's, it's like thousands and thousands of rolls of film. I mean, you'd be surprised that actually in the old days, they still would photograph tons. 
but no, it's like human beings picking everything <laughs> in the end. I'm just. I, uh, I don't know if this is working. Um, are you trying to like apply maybe like a filter of one artist's design onto another on another photograph? So like say like you have photograph from artist A and you apply a filter to it to make it more look like art artist B's photograph. Was that kind of like what you were trying to get at maybe with your second point in the talk? I think it's more like um, let's say I have a model that has been trained on all the bad and good photographs of artist A, right? And let me take like a stream of photographs taken by artist B and let me apply that model of A on B and what would A pick out of what B has photographed? And what would be the most like representative what A would think as good in that selection? Are, yeah. are you trying to like um, deduce some kind of style that it's only artist A is trying, like, has it been developing over a period of time or maybe a bit of both from both? Or? Yeah, possibly. And part of the reason I say that is because if I think about the way good artists are trained, that's actually what happens in like a human world. It's like you sit down with the photographer that's been working 20 years more than you, and they will go through what you photograph and give you their edit on what they think is the best images in your Group. Same principle with photo editors. Photo editors will do the same thing. They'll look through your contact sheets and say, this is a better shot than this one. Uh, this, this is kind of like a general question. Do you know if there are a lot of artists that have photos of the same exact picture? Maybe like from their own, like say like there's a hundred artists that all took a picture of the Eiffel Tower, for instance, like that could be a really cool data set to work with. Uh, probably not the same because everything is going to be different. I think it'd be very hard to take the exact same image as somebody else. Well, not the same image, oh. but like, you know, the same subject. Um, yes, there has been many, I mean, when you have um, journalists, for example, journalists will often be documenting the same event from, I mean, if you've ever seen like just masses of journalists kind of like converging on an event. So they'll have very similar photographs of the same thing. All right, thank you. I will run to the back. You can raise your <laughs> hand, it's fine. Um, so Jeff, when you, you had on your second sort of goal, and maybe it connects to this last set of questions, right? What does it mean to see like a different artist? And it makes me think of sort of the canonical, you know, James Scott book, seeing like a state and sort of, yeah, these questions around, um, yeah, sort of imposing certain styles onto others. And so, um, you know, it's sort of a half-formed question, which is how do you think about, yeah, the, what it means to help someone see like another artist and how turning that from, right, your mentor one-on-one -on -one with you is something similar or different from, you know, going in Apple Photos and then seeing like the artist that Apple Photos has decided is yeah. the artist in that system. I mean, I sort of explained to this person, I mean, the audience member on the question before of like how things go in real life, but there are times where you disagree, right? You go like, the photograph you picked, I don't like. Like, I actually think it stinks, like, mm -hmm. right? And that's like a conversation you have and you figure out what is the difference between the way you see and someone else sees. And I think in an ideal world, I mean, I don't, to be really fair, I, I think this is the technology and the training that would need to be, and this has to be like a commercial, I mean, a ton of resources probably need to be applied to this, mm -hmm. but if you had um, re like artist A, artist B, all the way to Z, and you just ran this on your images, and you could see like how different everything was. Ideally, these different models would all pick slightly different images that you could actually start to learn from, from that, right? You clearly couldn't get, you know, 30 some, professionals in a room looking at your work at the same time, but if you had algorithms to do it, that's just like informing your own creativity. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the ideal I would have. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's an interesting almost contrast to public policy where, you know, so you're almost embracing this idea of subjectivity and disagreement. Yes, and often in public yeah. policy, the very idea of algorithms is to sort of erase subjectivity in order to promote objectivity. And often that's a place where a lot of these efforts go wrong, sort of this around a very narrow notion of what objectivity means that leaves out many of the subjective, both leaves out many of the subjective dimensions behind 
objectivity, but also can erase right, the, that desire for discretion and flexibility. So it's interesting that you know, what you're seeing as AI is not the turn to objectivity, but often a way of pluralism and embracing yeah. the subjectivity of these decisions. Because the subjectivity is all baked into the way you train something, right? The way you create that algorithm has the subjectivities of like human experience. And so why not then embrace that side of AI mm -hmm. and try to make it work for you and what you want it to do versus like limiting it, you know, to one, to, to like a yes or no, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's not, I don't know. I mean, it's really where AI has been headed. And I think perhaps if there's like more creativity in the way we apply it, we could get a lot more use out of it. Mm -hmm. But that's a great point you made about the differences between the objectivity and subjectivity right, of it. Right, around what, yeah, what is the goal of AI in these settings and to what extent is it trying to augment or replace human decision making? Yeah. And I think that's in some ways where this difference comes in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the augment versus replace, right? Like, right. I, like, as I said before, like, I would never just say like, oh yeah, that's, like, I would never have the machine say that's the best picture because mm -hmm. if you're an artist, that's your claim, right? Like your way of seeing is taking all the resources you have and then you make the final decision. And that's okay because at the end of the day, your, the judgment is gonna be your, your spin, your style, what mm -hmm. you wanna bring to the world. Right. Um, different than, you know, if you're, trying to decide if someone goes to jail or not. That's like so different, right? Mm -hmm. That's like a whole different set of facts of like what you need to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. But even there, right, there is this ideal that we, there should be some forms of, yeah, it's not just a sort of simplified algorithmic objective decision that we can boil down to a formula. Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah. And it's thinking about how your decisions on your end are subjective in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. Like they, they inf they're informed by so much of, and that becomes probably part of their problem is um, if they get biased one direction or another too much, mm -hmm. what does that do to the fairness of, of right. what that algorithm is doing? Right. Let's see, any last any questions, questions or? Oh, we are out of time. This was very fun. Were you at time already? <laughs> <laughs> Please, um, yeah, let us know. I mean, we're both here, so unlike the other speakers, we are both um, at this university, so um, reach out to us if you have any more questions. And I think we're both teaching this year, too. Uh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so. Do you all want to mention the courses you're teaching? I'm teaching um, a class on social movements and the internet, where we learn about how the internet has influenced social movements. Um, not really AI related, but really just about like how, so, I mean, social media, we, we're going to run through like the history, sociological history of social movements, but then really end up with case studies from the past 10 years um, from all the way, you know, the Arab Spring, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, um, things like the Capitol Riot recently, and, and just really thinking about how the internet's affected all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll be teaching a class in the public policy school on values and ethics in public policy. So really thinking about how philosophy and political theory can provide a lens for thinking about uh, decision making in public policy and bringing in a lot of digital technology examples to play with um, around how, yeah, how thinking about ethics can provide a lens for more rigorous and reasoned decision making when developing policy and reasoning about hard choices that policymakers face.